This video is sponsored by HelloFresh. So the combination of the pandemic and working from home and recently working a job that has me sitting in this same spot for hours in the day has not had the best effect on my health or the health of my family. And since I or my wife are often cooking for four people, it takes pretty disciplined planning. And if the chicken isn't taken out of the freezer before somebody gets home, that means we're gonna end up eating takeout. So at the top of the year is a big deal for my family to just like do better and figure out how to feed all of us waste less money and be healthier. And that's right around the time that I found out that HelloFresh wanted to sponsor this video. So it was a match made in heaven. HelloFresh alleviates several of the things that I am not so good at in terms of food preparation. For one, by offering 50 different menu options where they send you exactly what you need to cook, it alleviates the need to go to the grocery store, buy food and not have it go spoiled in your refrigerator. If you wanna cook for two, you can just to have your meal set up and done. Or if you wanna cook for more, you can have extra that serves as meal prep for lunches on later days. And all the meals can be cooked in around 20 minutes, which is plenty of time, especially if you're about to watch an hour long video essay. And they have a ton of dietary options from family friendly meals, carb conscious meals, or vegan meals. Another great thing about HelloFresh is that they are environmentally conscious. Everything comes to you in pre-recycled materials that you can then recycle again. They source all their food from local farms, so your food is fresh, but also serving your local economy. And again, by having the food be pre-packaged and pre-portioned, you don't have to worry about wasting food and feeling like crap after it. There's legit a ton more I can say about HelloFresh, but this video is gonna be long enough already, long enough for you to probably cook five HelloFresh meals. So I just wanna let everyone know to go to hellofresh.com and use code FDSignifier16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. That's two weeks plus worth of meals along with some extra surprises. So go ahead, simplify your life a little bit in these ridiculous times, get you some free food and help the channel at the same time. Thank you so much to HelloFresh for supporting the channel and Enjoy the episode. There were high points in there somewhere, but overall, Drake's music didn't have a whole lot of real substance other than being catchy, highly entertaining, and, you know, cool. It was, it was, it was cool. And I want to be clear that this isn't a problem. This isn't illegal in hip hop. Most rappers well before then and up until now do want some semblance of pop and commercial appeal and success. Lots of pop rappers are still legends and highly respected in hip hop. Guys like Ludacris and Nelly dominated the early 2000s with classic hits and albums. And they were preceded by guys like Busta Rhymes and LL Cool J, who did the same thing in the early and mid 90s. Hip hop didn't have to be hard or street or even challenging or complex all the time. But when it was clear that a rapper was a nice amount more pop than hip hop, even if they were loved and appreciated, they would automatically be excluded from serious GOAT consideration, at least back in my day. I'm not very proud of this video, but I am so excited <laughs> to get some things off my chest. It's uh, it's gonna be a good video, y'all. I just hate that it comes at the cost of momentarily breaking a rule I have of not outright just dragging famous figures. This is, this is a bit different. People seem confused about how I could dislike a guy like Drake, who clearly works so hard to be liked by everyone. I would get questions about what my problem with Drake was and if he ever will get a video. Initially, I thought there's already enough blank is awful and here's why videos, no shade. Uh, do I really need to make another one? After all, despite his celebrity status, Drake is still a human. And in all his success and fame, it's gotta suck to turn on YouTube or Twitter or whatever and see random people you don't know shit on you and your work. I know what that feels like. And even when it's bad faith, crappy hot takes on your stuff, it's still not fun to be piled on by people at random just because they don't like your content. Shout out to all my haters out there, by the way, you know who you are. Further, I honestly didn't know if I had enough to say about Drake to make a whole video about him. 
his music it just isn't that deep. His story isn't that interesting. And my dislike of him and his music is pretty simple and straightforward. Drake's music is like pizza. It's entertaining and predictable and good, but you know, at the end of the day, not very nourishing, not very fulfilling, and you're probably gonna need to eat something healthier at some point in time. But after further contemplation, I realized there's more to my issues with Drake than Drake. It's really more what he represents as an artist than I was initially aware of. And that while I'll try not to just do a mean spirited screed on him as a person, because I don't know him as a person, but when I place him in the greater context of hip hop and what hip hop has been in the last decade, plus I realize there's actually so much to say and that I don't have to be all that mean spirited to say it. That said though, this will not be nice for him to watch if he were ever to watch it. And for that, I am genuinely regretful. So first and foremost, let's set the stage. According to All Top Everything, a raking site that purports to aggregate real data to make definitive top 10 lists, Drake is the second best-selling rapper of all time behind Eminem and has done that feat in probably around 10 less years than Eminem did. He is the most popular hip hop artist in the game right now and has easily been thus for the last five or six years. Drake is a hit making machine and has songs to set the party off, set the wedding reception off, set the Netflix and chill off, set the TikTok trend off. And let me be clear, these are not necessarily bad things to have that type of variety. These are not in and of themselves anti-hip hop. Drake, in terms of pure talent, is a top tier rapper and lyricist. He's able to turn a phrase, switch up a flow, ride a beat, and land a haymaker as good as any rapper that's ever done it. There's a reason that Drake is in the unique spot he's in. And I want to make sure that's understood. But let's look at this top 10 list. As you go down the list, a name should really jump out at you as soon as it comes across your screen. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Flo Rida is the number seven best-selling rapper of all time, above fucking Tupac. Is Flo Rida even a rapper? Who's to say? No, seriously. Who gets to make that distinction in 2021? We'll come back to that. I bring this up to establish early on that record sales is not a true marker for quality and impact as a hip hop artist. But if you took Flo Rida and you gave him better bars, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to avoid the shade in this one. This, this is where we're going. So just understand what you should get from this list is that white hip hop fans mean a lot to commercial success. And this, again, isn't automatically a problem, nor is it new. White hip hop fans in mass have never liked the same type of rap that traditional hardcore hip hop fans, black and white, have liked throughout history, which is why sales have never been a huge part of any conversation of who the all time greats or goats in hip hop are. Yes, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a lot of hip hop fans who wouldn't at this point have Drake somewhere in their top 10. And the confused Lost Souls might even have him in their top five, but no one has Flo Rida in their top five because we don't really care about sales. And understand that concept of the GOAT, that GOAT status is a pretty significant thing in the world of hip hop. It's emblematic of what hip hop is supposed to be and stand for. So to be a part of that conversation means a lot, or at least from my perspective, it used to mean a lot more. So how is this real? How can a guy that I am unflatteringly comparing to Flo Rida get involved in that GOAT conversation? What did he do? What did Drake do to get here? And what happened in hip hop to make that possible? If you recall from my Kanye videos, I argue that Kanye West reframed hip hop in his image in the early 2000s and completely broke the mold on what a rap superstar could do and look like and what mainstream hip hop could sound like. He ended an era of what I call hip hop kayfabe, which I describe as a performance of black masculinity, pantomiming this larger than life gangster or celebrity persona, something that arguably came into prominence with the likes of N.W.A. and was refined into its purest and most authentic form by Tupac and then ended with Kanye when Kanye refused to perform this kayfabe but became a superstar all the same. Kanye changed the landscape of what being a rap superstar could be 
And in his wake, other artists who also didn't fit that typical mold back then, with four artists in particular being the most prominent of this wave that he ushered in, that of Lupe Fiasco, Wale, Kid Cudi, and most successfully of this group by far, Drake. However, even in this new permutation of black masculinity that was more human and sensitive and introspective, Drake was really testing the boundaries of what black people and rap fans were willing to put up with. Lupe, my favorite of this group, was still from the South Side of Chicago, still closely aligned to traditional images of black masculinity and the streets. And similar things can be said for Kid Cudi and Wale and a lot of other figures that came in around this time. All of these men, like Kanye, were still cool still had commanding presences and confidence in their craft upon emerging on the scene. They may not have been gangster or street, but they were still able to exhibit enough of that traditional swag that we attribute to black men. Drake, on the other hand, his transgressions weren't just a matter of not being street. Drake just kind of seemed out of place, even among this new wave of more sensitive and more human rap stars. Drake was kind of a dork and it was hard not to notice early on. The mill, got degree, the niggas who cock and squeeze the steel. I do this for my niggas that got degrees and still broke as fuck. Fuck your flag, democracy has failed. I'm in a real estate with no properties for sale. Probably could build with Socrates himself. No soccer moms to throw us on soccer teams, but still kick shit so cold, boy, I can freeze in hell. Ready? All right. Look, uh, look, uh, New York, uh, uh, check. I say it like this, I say, um, uh. Vacuum materials and shine wheels. What's your life like? This how mine feels. I like my seat back. I like my wine chill. I look good, smell better, and I rhyme ill. I say I'm at these girls' neck and head. You it's clear Drake felt this sense of otherness for his presence, that he was a guest and not a real member of the hip hop community. He was outside of the box already without ever having been in it. He was tolerated for his potential and talent, but not accepted. And it's not like a lot of people really try to hide that that's what they thought of him. There was a prominent blogger at this time named Big Ghostface. I don't think it was the actual real Ghostface killer, but he wrote in like Ghostface killer's voice and he would do his yearly softest rappers list. And Drake was almost always on that list. And one year he was number 10 and number one. He would say shit like Drake was the only nigga on earth capable of turning sandpaper into moist towelettes and referring to Drake's sound as hold my purse music. And let's, uh, let's get into it. Let's, let's recognize a situation here. I can't go further without addressing the very obvious and unfair reasons why Drake dealt with a lot of ostracism in hip hop, especially earlier in his career. If you're too young to remember Drake's earlier days, just really a few years ago, he has always been the subject of ridicule, lots of jokes at his expense. And at the root of these jokes, it was often patriarchal standards of masculinity, specifically black masculinity that Drake didn't measure up to. Drake was biracial and raised by his white Jewish mother in Toronto, Canada, and was a child actor. His experiences growing up were mostly devoid of the type of texture we associate with rap artists. Now, economically, Drake wasn't privileged, but he did not fully grow up in the same culture of Toronto that say Cardinal Official or Chaos were from. I don't rock with the biracial people aren't black stuff. I believe that being clearly coded as black in any colonized nation and acknowledging said coding in your daily life is really all that is required to have a black experience. And all black experience aren't and don't have to be the same. But not everyone is like that. There is a lot of ridiculous mess going on on TikTok, which I won't touch. And because of this, there are a lot of people that do feel like being light skinned, especially as a man, means something more on how you act and how you present. And Drake brought on a renaissance of light skinned men jokes with almost all of them directed at how light skinned men are somehow not as masculine as dark skinned men. And that is some anti-black shit to perpetuate. On top of this, Drake's music was definitely more geared toward female listeners of hip hop. In fact, he kind of revolutionized this in a way he doesn't get enough credit for. Some, if not most of it is still, you know, soft boy misogyny, but every rapper for the longest would always have at least one song dedicated to showing love for the ladies. But really, most of these were really bad in retrospect. And even the best ones were still very much from a male centered perspective, but Drake was different. His songs for women were more effectively angled to make the women feel centered 
in the music as opposed to the songs being about them, if that makes sense. Take a song like Fancy, Drake's first single off his first album featuring T.I., a rapper who is so misogynist that even hip hop is like, dude, chill, you, you're doing too much. Drake has lyrics like, My pants weighs, time heals off, and heels hurt to walk in. They go with the clutch that you carry your lip gloss in. And look, I really think nobody does it better. I love the way that you put it together. It just fills you with warm vibes. That's like, what, what woman wouldn't want to hear that from her man, right? And then here comes T.I. Well, aren't you a breath of fresh air? From all these superficial gold digging bitches in here. They get a ball of fit, they ain't got a pick a career. I guess they plan on second kitchen until some knees appear. Yeah. <clears throat> So because of this, Drake garnered a strong female fandom, which because of the way patriarchy works, we just will always hate on any artist, rapper, musician, whatever, who does that. It's just some shit that motherfuckers do. It's not even a black thing. It's just a male thing. I don't wanna get into all that. The point here is that a lot of these were prominent, unfair criticisms that Drake had to face in his earliest years as an artist, and it played out in his music. You can hear, Tense of frustration and insecurity in his lyrics at the time, feeling like he had the core talent to be a rap superstar. And he became very successful, but hip hop as a whole early on kind of kept him at an arm's distance. Looking back, although I definitely participated in my fair share of Drake's slander, I regret that. If not just because the focus on these shallow criticisms kind of hid bigger concerns that we didn't think about at the time. So if you don't like Drake, and these are your reasons. These are bad reasons to dislike Drake. Before moving on, I do also wanna to touch on the very weird and concerning grooming type behavior that Drake has exhibited over the years. Having text message conversations with underage white female celebrities, Millie Bobby Brown and Billie Eilish. I'm honestly inclined that these two cases and probably maybe some other cases that we don't know about are really just situations where Drake's insatiable desire for clout and to be relevant in every famous person's friend clashes with fucking common sense. If you haven't noticed, Drake has this thing where if something is popular, he really wants you to know that he likes it too. Oh, this sports team is good. This is Drake's favorite sports team. This rapper is popular. Wow, that's crazy. Drake likes them too. Afrobeat getting hot? Not without Drake, it's not. Wow, drum. That cha-cha song has a really good, cool Latin Caribbean groove. Be ashamed to not have Drake get a piece, right? I like to cha-cha, hey. I like to cha-cha, hey. Where did the man again? 20 minutes later. Uh, and I know when now I like bleak. That can only mean one thing. I know it's shameless, really. And while I don't think it's good that this 30-year-old man has text message exchanges with teenage girls that aren't in his family. I don't think it's due to a predatory nature, but that's my perception based off what I know. And sadly, scarily, maybe we never know what's gonna come out in the future, but I'm just gonna go with that for now. Drake also has shady behavior that often hovers around him. Members of his entourage have assaulted people, bullied people in the streets. There's this bizarre story about hot sauce and a condom that just came out. I'm not excusing any of these things or condoning them, especially if they're true, but they're for one, sadly, par for the course in the rap world to extent. To complain about misogyny, soft boy misogyny or whatever in hip hop is not pointless, but it's an unfair criticism within the context of what I'm doing here, especially from a lifelong hip hop fan who's loved his fair share of misogynistic rap music since I was a kid. So. I'm not gonna try to pull that out to attack Drake for it now. That'd be hypocritical. So if you came for the easy slander on Drake being soft or corny or a bad guy, that's kind of all you're getting there. From my perspective, those things are legitimate or significant, but they're not the big problem that I made this video for. To me, the issue of Drake is more complex than Drake but what he means as an artist and what he represents in the evolution or possibly the de-evolution of hip-hop in the last 10 years. And further, these are my views and opinions. And more than any other video I've done on this channel, I want to be critical of my unique standpoint and perspective and biases because they greatly inform this take. I think I've made it clear on prior controversial subjects that I don't expect or ask people to cancel or uncancel their phase or stop liking certain figures because of their problematic behavior. I just don't see that as realistic or helpful in the long run. But I am trying to get across a particular message 
intertwined with Drake over the course of this video. Dime 2 has this really awesome video on the commodification of music. And it's not just hip hop, although hip hop is a really good example of how this works. I'm gonna leave it in the description for you to check out, but the gist of it is assessing how hip hop in particular, but again, all other forms of music, have went through a specific commodification process that has really stripped it of so much of its core elements in order to make it more palatable for commodification and to be bought and sold in a capitalist society. And Drake kind of perfectly encapsulates what that looks like in 2022. But to explain that, we kind of got to start with what hip hop was before that process really got underway. We got to contextualize the world of hip hop before Drake. Hip hop isn't just a style of music. It's a cultural aesthetic and philosophy to an extent. It was born of a mixture of black exceptionalism and creativity, but also black struggle and pain. While many early figures of importance in hip hop were informed by Afro-Caribbean and the blues and rock and roll and disco, hip hop is still definitely a urban black American art form, regardless of the varieties of how it exists throughout the world today. But because of its ubiquitous nature, it is very much a highly sought after commodity like all art. When hip hop emerged as this cool new thing, it didn't take long to realize that as an art form, it had immense potential as a commodity. And there was extreme value to be extracted from it. Hip hop, like other black music before it, such as the blues and rock and roll, offered this intimate window into blackness. It put our souls on display. And audiences, especially white audiences, who as a product of white supremacist hegemony really destroyed any nature of a cultural history of their own, have always been thirsty for and drawn to the rawness and realness of black souls translated through our music. But unlike the blues and rock and roll, for whatever reason, it was much harder for hip hop to be easily replicated and commodified by capitalist interests without the participation and consent of the hip hop community. For one, there was just something about hip hop that couldn't be like faked and replicated effectively by the white participants in hip hop. And there was something about the white participants in hip hop who were true fans that made them more loyal to the culture than their rock and roll counterparts. There are a lot of really significant white figures in hip hop who were just as protective of the culture as black hip hop figures. You look at a guy like Elvis who was able to easily steal the soul of black rock and roll and become a megastar bigger than any of his peers. And you compare him to a guy like Vanilla Ice who rode a short wave, but once it was made clear that the real rap and hip hop fans rejected him, his wave stopped almost instantly. He couldn't reproduce the realness of what hip hop was. I'm not sure what causes this. Maybe it was the hindsight of seeing what happened to black blues and rock and roll artists. It's hard to say, but suffice to say, even as hip hop became more and more commercial and commodified and bigger and bigger across the world, it was still very much within the control of the originators of the culture to an extent. And to me, this is because of this informal, often invisible guiding force in hip hop that I'm gonna call the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers are a variety of figures throughout the history of hip hop. Sometimes they were street level record executives and label owners, radio hosts and DJs, local entertainment, and sometimes criminal enterprise figures. The corporate interests that really controlled the music industry at the time did not have any real care for hip hop and hip hop culture and what it meant to the fans and the people. They only cared about the capital to be extracted from it. And they controlled the means of production for hip hop artists to gain the most out of their art. The gatekeepers played a role here in managing this thirst for extracting capital with maintaining a semblance of control over what hip hop was and not letting it be destroyed. Imagine the gatekeepers of hip hop as the Jedi Council, surely not the most effective bureaucratic entity, but even at their worst, providing a seriously important service behind the scenes. They were the figures that made sure that hip hop for the longest didn't end up like rock and roll. And they often did this by kind of managing just who within the hip hop world was able to wield its power and influence over the culture, whose music was allowed to represent the culture and be celebrated by it in full, and whose was only provisionally connected. They established a hegemonic idea of what hip hop was and influenced participants in the culture to protect and reify this hegemony. For a generation of black youth until now, 
mostly, hip hop felt so precious because it was this beautiful and amazing thing that uniquely belonged to us. And we had this divine right to dictate what was to be done with it and to make money from it. But to ensure this, it took a lot of other processes. To keep this power under our control required a lot of other compromise. For example, back in my day, to be a rap superstar, you usually have to go through almost a hero's journey of activities. First, the rapper would have to be somewhat talented and find an audience of some sort, maybe do some local shows or freestyle battles, and make a demo tape. Then they shop that demo tape to other people and get a buzz going and somewhere along the line, they get someone to help navigate them in the form of a manager. And then that manager would really start taking them to the gatekeepers. And then at that point, it would be like collecting signatures in a form. At those intervals where they met with a gatekeeper, the gatekeeper would like ask two essential questions. One, is this person going to add to or take from the culture? And then two, is there money to be made here? Ideally, it would be both. Ideally, the answer would be that they would add to the culture and you can make money, but not often. Often the gatekeeper will have to choose one issue over the other. Sometimes checking just one of those boxes worked out fine. Sometimes not so much. The gatekeepers were far from perfect for all the protection of hip hop. There was, there was also plenty of toxic and exploitative actions that came out of their power. But overall, at least since the early eighties until I'll say the early 2010s, hint, hint, it's safe to say that they helped a lot of young black artists and business people and other media figures get rich off of black art while maintaining the sanctity of said art. But they also made the corporations richer and richer as well. But hip hop was alive and thriving. So how was all of this related to Drake? You probably already know where I'm going with this. If the hip hop gatekeepers are the Jedi Council, then to me, Drake is Anakin Skywalker. So before Drake, rappers had to go through that previously mentioned process and work hard at their craft and hope to eventually get the approval of the gatekeepers to get a shot at access to the corporate interests and corporate funding to make them a star. But by the 2010s, when Drake was starting to get hot, technology and websites dedicated to spreading hip hop mixtapes in the era before SoundCloud, like Dat Piff and Hip Hop DX and mixtapes.com and probably other stuff I can't remember, the most talented rappers now could get their music directly in the hands of the fans and directly in front of large audiences without needing to run that pantheon for the gatekeep. They could amass a buzz, get paid, and even get corporate attention all without any stamp of approval. This had good and bad consequences. On one end, it meant that the true talents of the art form had less barriers to be found by the fans and didn't have to open themselves up to the exploitation by certain corporate interests who, to be clear, the gatekeepers served at the end of the day. It also meant that there was no longer an order to things. So along with Drake, other acts took similar routes and made arguably good music, skipping over the issue of hierarchy and going straight into massive fandom without missing a beat. Drake's mixtape, So Far Gone, cemented him in the culture in one way or another. It was so good that even with its transgressive content being so overly lovelorn and sensitive with these ballads and introspective themes, it was held up by tons of young fans and bloggers who were exposing themselves to be some of the new tastemakers in the industry to be the next best thing. Drake did still grind out a lot of time as a small artist doing shows in Houston and Atlanta and Toronto, but with the buzz he built independently, he circumvented all of the usual approval processes that were in place. Drake just dropped some really good stuff in the internet and he merged on the other side with a huge following and a lot of power and autonomy. Suddenly, he was the hottest new unsigned artist in hip hop. You know, my my goal at this point is just to really keep making that organic music. I, I don't want to feel pressured now that, you know, I have a single and I have, you know, music that's that's hot. I don't want to be pressured to be like, oh, I have to get radio hits and I have, I just want to make music that people enjoy. You know, um, I have fans from all different walks of life. I got fans like in the pop world. I got fans, you know, in, in, in hip hop. And uh, I mean, I, I just want to find a way, I want to find a way to, to really give them all something that, that they can enjoy. With this buzz, Drake joined Young Money and along with Lil Wayne and Nicki Minaj, they made one of the most successful rap super clicks in the history of hip hop. 
He also took direction from Lil Wayne and for a few years just would pop on with tracks with other major rap artists, spin napalm verses, making sure that despite any misgivings about his pop overtures and his singing, you had to understand that Drake was an MC. Let me infiltrate, let me infiltrate that pop world and, and at least, you know, if the song is catchy or it has melody to it and that's not what you like, at least you know in those verses, I'm gonna spit my heart out, you know, regardless, no matter what type of song it is. Drake established that if you were good enough, you didn't need to walk the gauntlet required by the gatekeepers to get money. Drake established that if you on your own created enough buzz that the fans would demand the gatekeepers move on your behalf, that the corporations will have to come to you with blank checks. He wasn't the first to do this. We have to stop ignoring Soldier Boy kind of map this out the first time. <laughs> Drake! <laughs> Drake? The nigga that got bitey by Pusha T? With the release of his first album, Under Young Money, Thank Me Later, it was clear that Drake was still going to go the pop artist route as much as a hip hop artist route. There were high points in there somewhere, but overall Drake's music didn't have a whole lot of real substance other than being catchy, highly entertaining, and you know, cool. It was, it was, it was cool. And I wanna be clear that this isn't a problem. This isn't illegal in hip hop. Most rappers well before then and up until now do want some semblance of pop and commercial appeal and success. Lots of pop rappers are still legends and highly respected in hip hop. Guys like Ludacris and Nelly dominated the early 2000s with classic hits and albums. And they were preceded by guys like Busta Rhymes and LL Cool J, who did the same thing in the early and mid 90s. Jay-Z, an all-time great, was a master at carefully trading the line between crossover appeal and true hip hop relevance. Hip hop didn't have to be hard or street or even challenging or complex all the time. But when it was clear that a rapper was a nice amount more pop than hip hop, even if they were loved and appreciated, they would automatically be excluded from serious GOAT consideration, at least back in my day. And back then, that is what happened to Drake. In November of 2011, Drake dropped Take Care, his second album. To many, this is looked at as his best and most Drakiest of albums, dripping with R&B ballads and sincerity. Some of his most classic songs like Marvin's Room are on there. It was a safe but well-received follow-up to his safe and well-received debut. Both these albums confirm what most in hip hop thought about Drake. He was cool. He was capable of delivering some good songs, but nobody was ever gonna say Drake is my favorite rapper. Nobody that took hip hop seriously, at least. Drake wasn't changing anyone's lives with his music unless, you know, you met a girl at a party somewhere or, you know, like I, I have one vivid memory of Drake's soothing voice in my ear at pinups in Decatur. And like, I'm standing there in the smoking room and the stripper pole's in front of me and there's a beautiful woman just gliding across. And she's so graceful. I lost track there. You, you get my point though. His music had a place. It just wasn't at the top. Drake was in a good spot where the Ludacris's and the Nellies were, but those guys really never occupied the same conversation as hip hop's real greats like Nas, Rakim, Jay-Z, Biggie, and Tupac. But being thought of as the new Ja Rule, I don't think fully sat well with Drake. If you listen to his music, especially songs like Over on his first album or Successful on So Far Gone, you hear Drake pining to be accepted and respected in hip hop among his peers and not just the cool pop rapper guy. And this was made more complicated because hip hop at this time was in a transitional stage where you wondered maybe Drake had a point. The gatekeepers had lost a lot of power and many of the rap greats were aging out of relevance as new fans emerged that weren't alive during the golden era. And there was a lot of new significant rap artists in the early 2010s, and none of them stood out as true megastars much more than Drake had. They all also seemed more focused on commercial success than truly making timeless music. J. Cole, ASAP Rocky, Meek Mill, all of them delivered great moments, but if you compared their bodies of work to Drake, it was really at most a difference in taste. It was hard to say that any one of them was definitely better. Plus, we knew Drake skill-wise was at the top of the food chain and that maybe he was capable of something great. We just weren't expecting it from him. And so you have to think about it. If all of these rappers are equally seeking commercial appeal and Drake was by far the best at that, I mean, by default, that should mean Drake is next up 
next to wear the crown. It didn't feel right to a lot of people in hip hop, I think, but I mean, that's just the reality we were looking at. Many in hip hop who were contemplating the future of the, the culture seriously entertained that maybe it is Drake. Maybe he'll truly captivate us with his next record and fully pull ahead of his competition. That was what was in the back of our heads. You could almost see us hesitantly holding the crowd over his head, just about to lower it until Kendrick Lamar dropped Good Kid Mad City in October of 2012, and it was an immediate revelation to the hip hop world. Never had commercial fans, old heads, casual and new hip hop fans come together to immediately agree. This is who we're waiting for to lead us into the future of hip hop. He was the first new artist on the scene that clearly seemed worthy of carrying the torch for hip hop for a new generation. His music wasn't just good. He wasn't just able to make songs that would fill up a dance floor or you could ride or smoke to or argue about in basements and dorm rooms. No, it was also drenched in the aesthetic and traditions of black culture and black music. Good Kid Mad City contained countless allusions to the sounds of blues and jazz and rock and roll. Like Tupac and Jay-Z before him, Kendrick had immense pop appeal without lowering himself to make actual pop music. He was everything the gatekeepers could have hoped for, everything the fans loved, and everything the corporations required all in one figure. And if you were paying attention at the time, you could kind of see that this might have had an effect on Drake. You know, uh, I'm so sick of people saying that uh, that I'm like lonely and emotional and like associating me with this like longing for a woman or sad guy. Yeah, yeah, I hate that, man. It bothers me so much because I don't make the, you know, like I, I do make I do make music that makes you feel something. But, you know, I, I just don't like I'm actually not that guy in real life. I'm very happy. You know. To his credit, Drake did not just take this line down. He did not want to be denied his shot at the crown. And he came back with what a lot of people see as his best ever album. And what many see today as the last album where he truly tried, nothing was the same. So that was one thing that I understood on this record. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna play this humble, um, you know, sort of shy, like new guy, like happy to be here role this time around. You know, I put in enough work and I plan to put on, put put in as, as, as much as I need to moving forward. Um, and I wanna, I wanna make that known, you know. I'm in this album, you can hear Drake doing his best not to just make hits, but genuinely good, challenging music. He was showing sensitivity and vulnerability, but differently. People would always call Drake sensitive for his old content, right? But really, if you're paying attention, all Drake was doing in a lot of the songs was being like, I have feelings. I feel sad because girls and love and fear. But here he was more like, these are my feelings. These are my fears. These are my traumas. These are my hopes. It was revelatory in a lot of ways, and it's my favorite album, and it was a commendable effort to do something that was more meaningful than the kind of really safe pop fluff stuff he was doing before then. But, but the shit wasn't even close. I mean, like, come on, come on now. Come on, come on, come on. All right, so real quick, we're doing a uh, one of those editing bay uh, editorial moments because I forgot I think a pretty big part of this story which is Kendrick's control verse that I want to make this too long but suffice to say after Kendrick came on the scene and ignited hip-hop and hip-hop fans in a way that people thought wasn't you know possible anymore well you know maybe like six to eight months later he did a song with Big Sean where he dropped this verse that set the rap world on fire in this verse Kendrick Lamar kind of it was like a victory lap he asserts his status as the, you know, rapper of the era as of now and, you know, calls out by name all his contemporaries. He, he basically says, I'm trying to kill all of y'all so that nobody thinks of rap, thinks of y'all before they think of me. And that goes for Jamaica, Big Crit Wale, Pusha T, Meek Mills, ASAP Rocky, Drake, Big Sean, J Electron, Tyler McMiller. I got love for you all, but I'm trying to murder you niggas. Trying to make sure your core fans never heard of you niggas. They don't want to hear not one more now no verb from you niggas. And it was dope and it was exciting and yada, yada, yada. 
And uh, there's an interview I'm gonna splice right here. I'm saying, um, and and he's doing his thing really well. Um, and that verse was, he's giving people like moments, you know, like that, that verse was a, a moment to talk about. Um, are you listening to it now at this point in time? Okay. No, and like, no, no, no. I, no, now mind you, it'll go on and complex and rap radar, give it like verse of the millennium and all that shit. Was, I saw him five days later at the VMAs and it was all love. So it's like, I almost wish he had come in there on that shit because I kind of lost like a little respect for the sentiment of the verse. If it's really fuck everybody, then it needs to be fuck everybody. It just can't be halfway for the sake of the people. But you know what I'm saying? Like for real, that's just how I- f And it's, it's emblematic in that the, the, the thing I didn't know was that this verse was getting hot and like in the system right around when Drake was finishing up nothing was the same and so you can see in the moment and this is admirable and I hope like I don't like Drake but like I don't want to come off as making it seem like he is irredeemable as an artist over the course of his career especially this early part he was trying and he really did try or nothing was the same to you know keep up and run in the same race as Kendrick and his contemporaries. Um, but you know, it, it didn't work out. And so it just kind of further speaks to how this moment serves as a turning point for Drake, which I'm going to get to later in the video. So I I'll just leave that there. That year's Grammy awards are infamous. Now understand like awards from white institutions have never been all that coveted in hip hop, but it was still nice. And Drake had inexplicably won the Best Rap Album Award the previous year with Take Care, beating far superior records like The Roots' Undone or Nas' Life Is Good. But this year, both Drake's magnum opus, Nothing Was The Same, and Kendrick Lamar's Good Kid, Mad City were nominated for Best Rap Album. But the award was won by fucking Macklemore. You ever hear more skullduggery in your life? To his credit, Colin reached out to Kendrick to apologize for winning and express publicly that he shouldn't have won and we all knew why he did. It was a decent gesture that took only a little sting out, but it was better than what we were used to getting. Not to Drake hating ass though. Like, you won. Why are you posting your text messages? Just chill, take your W and if you feel you didn't deserve it, go get better. Make better music. It felt cheap. It didn't feel genuine. Why do that? Why is your guilt? You think those guys would pay homage to you if, if they won? To name just Kendrick, that shit made me feel funny. No, in that case, you robbed everyone. We all need text messages. We all need text messages. Um, in retrospect, I'm wondering if Drake felt even more like a fraud because Macklemore had the guts to do what he didn't do the previous year for Nas or The Roots. When Macklemore respects the culture more than you do, Lots of different journalists and cultural commentators look at this moment as where Drake changed. At this point, Drake stopped caring about approval from the core of hip hop fans. He stopped wanting to come off as sensitive and vulnerable in his music. And to be honest, kind of started getting a bit reckless, like a badass kid, Matt, they didn't get a toy. I would have all of your fans if I didn't go pop and I stayed on some conscious shit. I would have so many more friends if I lost my success and my confidence. This is where Champagne Poppy is probably born. He gained weight, got a pinch more aggressive in his lyrical content, grew a beard, and got a lot less sensitive. In the same year where Kendrick Lamar would release the best album probably of the decade, erasing any further doubt that this is some type of competition in the eyes of hip hop fans, Drake would release, if you're reading this, it's too late. Not really an album. I, I can't remember what he called it, a mood soundtrack or something very, new hip hop sounding. It began Drake's very intentional focus on commodifying himself to the maximum, manipulating the growing world of streaming sales. He no longer set out to compete with Drake or Cole or 21 Savage or any other new era rappers. His only target was the charts. And again, going back to Dime 2's video, here is where Drake essentially draws the line that I am no longer an artist. I am a commodity. I don't make music, I make content. In the process of losing hip hop's heart, Drake recognized that he had gained something else in abundance, which is white fans. And not the white fans who've always again loved and been around hip hop that love it closely in the same way that black fans love it, but a type of white fan that's always hovered around the peripheral of hip hop culture that comes to its concerts and spends money and been appreciated to an extent because you know those dollars are what made the rappers rich 
but it's the type of fan most rappers didn't want to be known for having that didn't want to make up the bulk of their fan base unless of course you were you know ja rule Flo Rida, or drake but something was different hip-hop as a culture had clearly signaled to the rest of the world that kendrick was the current king of the game the current leader of the culture but the rest of the world wasn't listening they weren't following our lead and to be honest i don't know if we were all on one accord in our directions as drake pivoted further away from making any type of meaningful music he also became more prominent and respected in hardcore hip-hop conversations and media there were still memes about drake but the same voices that decried drake as a pop star were shouted down as haters and out of touch old heads and there's truth to that that's real am i so out of touch no it's the children who are wrong and i remember thinking that we just need to accept that hip-hop was different and more splintered and varied in our era and that drake may not be what we imagine and want hip-hop to be going forward but he was still a top tier lyricist he still made hits he still respected the culture as far as we could tell and he wasn't going to hurt it by himself by being so prominent right right in 2005 some jealousy on the form of meek mill creeped into the mainstream or on twitter and meek mill at the time a very successful very street credible and much more respected rapper with much less of a prominent space accused drake of not writing all his own raps and eventually came with solid proof that that was the case which in the world of hip-hop a world that champions authenticity and heart in his music should have been a huge and career ending revelation, especially for a guy like Drake. And here was a unique challenge. Nobody looked at Drake as a rap beef guy. There had been shots taken at him before and he sent some subliminals back every now and then, but to call him out directly, I don't know. It, it seemed like it would have been looked at as almost bullying before now, but if Drake wanted to hold the throne to be in GOAT conversations, he was gonna have to win some battles. Drake released a lukewarm disc record, much to everyone's surprise. It didn't blow anyone away, but you know, it was good. It was cool. But then things got interesting. I kind of more like rappy, mm. you know, it was gonna be another like 100 bar thing. And uh, and um, I was with Serena at the time. And uh, we had been talking a lot about, um, about her and Sharapova going back and forth over the years. And um, she had made this, made this comment to me and she was like, well, look, um, if you're gonna go, if you're gonna go again, you know, you, you, that, like, she's like, that beat that's on in there, it's just that she's like, you gotta finish it. Mm. She, and you know, she's a top competitor. Right. So she was like, you gotta finish it. Like I'm talking about done, mm. over. And it's gotta be something that, that, everyone that he's with and him have to hear. Drake released back to back the second disc record in less than a week. And aside from being pretty damn good, it also weaponized his popularity. So you saw these large sold out concerts of people shitting on Meek Mill. It was kind of impossible for him to respond to effectively. The song was a billboard hit and was played on a radio and suddenly the pressure was on Meek Mill and I know a lot of Drake deniers thought Meek Mill, Mr. Dreams and Nightmares was going to blow him away. Meek had every real advantage in terms of hip hop beef, battle rap experience, credibility, like real co-signs from the culture, but it was a disaster. I just wanna know how niggas going to jail, telling on niggas coming back home and it's still being cool. I just wanna know how niggas on Instagram and Twitter with 50,000 followers ain't got no money in real life. <laughs> So with 
Yeah, tell me you a pussy in the fan. Meek Mill released this bloated, confusing, hard to listen to, unfocused diss track, which used samples from WWE songs that he couldn't even clear because like the WWE, as you know, on this channel, don't let anybody deal with their shit. It was an embarrassment. It was an embarrassment to the tradition of hip hop and rap one-upsmanship and one of the biggest L's to be handed out in recent memory. Meek Mill had lost the beef hands down on his own merit, let alone in the eyes of rap fans. I'd argue his career has never been the same since. And suddenly Drake had something that he had never had before. Street cred. The heinous accusations of Drake having a ghostwriter were lost in the ether and Drake emerged more powerful than before. And he now had a street cred battle scarred veneer to go along with the squeaky clean marketable image akin to white rappers. Drake was unstoppable. But then the street spun the block again. A few years later with Drake casually riding waves, literally, Drake would find himself in another beef, this time with another rapper with much greater street cred, Pusha T. Close associate of Kanye West and long-standing Drake hater. And this time Drake would lose handily. In fact, his response is fucking embarrassing to hip hop. After an initial back and forth with a record from Pusha T and a record from Drake that was, you know, maybe a tie, Pusha released a second diss track, The Story of Adidon, which was a brutal attack on Drake's character with the major issue revealing that Drake was hiding a child he had secretly birthed with an adult film star, shattering his squeaky clean image of being a ladies man and drudging up all the previous issues that a lot of people had had with them up until that point. So what did Drake do? Did he grab his pen and hit the notebook and hit the booth and like evoke the spirit of Pac and, you know, the traditions of Jay-Z and Nas and KRS-One and MC Shan and say, look, I'm gonna have to let motherfuckers know you don't fuck with Champagne Pop, you know, no. Uh, Drake responded with a press release and a statement. I know everyone's enjoying the circus, but I want to clarify this image in question. This was not from a clothing brand shoot or my After which he seemingly reached out to Jay Prince, one of the few old heads that had had his back from day one, a very respected figure in hip hop who quietly, clearly killed the beef behind the scenes. Later, he would talk about how Pusha had gone too far, but claimed that he, he did write a really mean song to go back at Pusha T. But at the end of the day, it felt he didn't want to stoop to that level. It was some, some Karen shit, low key. And from my perspective, the least hip hop thing to have happened in the last decade. If so, yeah, competition is is, is inherent in the, in the art form. Um, confrontation just kind of comes with the territory. And there's something to be said for um, the fact that, you know, a lot of people talk that talk and, and you know, just do it because that's what hip hop is about. Well, I'm gonna talk and I'm gonna talk like I'm the biggest dog, but I'm not. I'm actually the one guy, the young guy, the one young guy that can really step up to the plate and talk my game. And you, I check out, you know, if you, if you choose to go and research, I check out. As aspirated by Pusha, at this point in your career, in your life, do you think you could ever squash things or mend things with him? Well, you know, I'm at, I'm at a I'm at a great um, healing place in my life. Um, it's not a fun life when you're like just in a lot of beefs with people. You know, you got to check on who's gonna be at an event. You start moving different. You start, you know, um, I was changing. I was changing as a person, um, becoming a guy that was, you know, definitely willing to do some terrible things. Definitely moving with a different energy. You mentioned his woman. You know, the Duppy freestyle, like. He has a point. He can say, yo, you brought up my lady's name. Oh, all bets are off the table. That's fine. You know, like I said, we all think differently, right? right. And even like, you know, even in, even in the Me and Meek situation, if you listen back to those records. Now, I can already see some comments being typed about how this was a good thing and that Drake saved violence from happening in hip hop and we wouldn't want another Biggie and Tupac situation. But no, no. Biggie and Tupac's death were the results of many things, but not really the result of the actual animosity between them. Further, hip hop has been full of few. It is a combative musical art form that pulls upon African traditions of boasting and signifying and turning a phrase to one up a competitor in the spirit of the art and sport and love. And 
only has ever rarely turned violent until recently with some of you young dudes, but that's a whole nother video. So no, this response from Drake was not okay in the eyes of hip hop. You would have thought that this would have been a huge blow to Drake, but the result was nothing. Nothing about Drake's career changed. Nothing was the same. It was too late. We were doing TikTok dances to a song a few months later. And there, at least for me, a reality set in that had probably been in effect since 2013. Decreeing who was the GOAT in hip hop, who was and wasn't fully of the culture, was no longer our decision to make. It didn't matter that Kendrick was very obviously in the traditions of hip hop as we've known it for the last 34 years. Drake would not be denied. At best, Kendrick would have to share the throne room with Drake. At some point between 2010 and 2016, hip hop stopped belonging to the black people that originated it and started belonging to the world or more accurately to the corporations. The legacy of the gatekeepers that kept hip hop within our influence for that 30, 40 year period, it was done. It was a wrap. Black people, black men especially, were no longer the arbiters of taste and meaning within the hip hop world. We were just another market base and we're easily ignored because we don't have the deepest pockets. And this is the horrifying reality that a lot of rap fans like me that came up in the gold and the silver age are maybe struggling to accept. On one hand, this has been amazing for the growth of hip hop in a lot of ways. For one, artists can now create much more autonomous careers without needing to rely on corporations for support. No more getting signed to a major record label and being jerked around for five years until your buzz is dead and never getting a shot. No more having to compromise on your music and being told to make certain types of songs for radio play. No more need for radio play. Nobody listens to the radio anymore. In the era before Drake, my era, we don't get a Danny Brown for real. We don't get Denzel Curry. We don't get a renaissance career recharge from Lupe Fiasco or three of Nas's best albums within a two year period. A lot of bad faith actors and vultures and snakes within the hip hop world that were respected and loved and listened to have died in the process. And that is a good thing. The artists get more money. The artists don't have to do as much work and other figures flourish. As a whole, hip hop is richer, wealthier, healthier. The music is darker and brighter and sexier and weirder and more conscious and more inclusive and more fun. And in general, all of this is a good thing, but the price of this renaissance feels like it came at the cost of something beautiful. There was something beautiful to feeling like hip hop belonged to you in a special way back in the day. And maybe that still exists now, and maybe the loss of that won't mean anything for the generation that is shepherding hip hop forward at the moment. But from my perspective, it does feel like something is missing. That Drake opened the door for a litany of other pop rappers who offer little to no regard for hip hop, often being openly hostile to it, but still wanting to reap the benefits from it, taking from it without giving back. Whereas before these types of acts would make a few dollars and then quickly be excised from the culture, they are now following Drake's formula. And if they have enough talent and a few lucky breaks and a couple of unfortunate cosigns from established hip hop artists, they're occupying significant space within the hip hop world, spaces that probably should be taken up by better artists with much more to offer the culture. I went over a lot of stuff in this video about why I have a problem with Drake. And most of these criticisms of Drake are well known by most of his fans and his anti-fans, and they've been mostly brushed aside, and I get why. If it was just this casual anti-fan argument in the running jokes I've had about Drake's music being vapid, I probably wouldn't have made a whole video, let alone a video that's, I don't know, this is probably been an hour long at this point, we'll see. But in the past few years, Drake has an arguably become a part of the GOAT conversation. And as he's maintained a space of supreme prominence and influence as a rapper, in the last few years, one last issue I think needs to be pointed out that I haven't seen enough conversation about, which is Aubrey Drake Graham does not care about black people. Sometimes I do feel like if, uh, you know, 
sometimes I don't feel celebrated when I know maybe somebody else would be celebrated for those accomplishments, you know? Yeah. I don't feel like people say, when, 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 when Drake is the artist of the decade, I don't think anybody says, wow, a black artist is the artist of the decade. I don't think anybody says that, really. I never heard anybody say that in the last few weeks. Um, you know, and I associate, my, you know, I, I associate myself as a black man. So for me, um, I, yeah, it just, it's sometimes I, I, I some, it's something that I just acknowledge and I just keep it moving. But, you know, like I said, I feel like if the situation was different, I feel like maybe some of the, some of the massive accomplishments and accolades that we've, yeah. that we've, that we've conquered on behalf of all of us, not just me. It's not like some, you know, it's, just, it's for all of us, right? Just like how excited I am when anybody else in our space does something great, you know? Yeah, of course, there's a part of me that wishes that I was So, where were we? Had to re-record this section because uh, we had some audio issues and some camera blur issues and some other things. So, we're gonna pick up where we left off. Where did we leave off? Black excellence, but I guess when it comes to me, it's not the same, no. All goodies. That just pushed me to do the things we all couldn't. When you look at Drake's contemporaries, I see them as the last generation of mainstream rap stars shepherded in by the gatekeepers, which are, you know, Meek Mill and ASAP and Nipsey Cole. Kendrick McShawn, Wale, Lupe, probably some other ones I'm not thinking of. If you know anything about most of that cohort, their music and their personas outside of hip hop, then you know that all of them engage constantly with black struggle and black experiences. Black consciousness is core to their art in some form or fashion. They're not all street. Lupe and Wale and Cole aren't really street. They're not all dark skin. They're not even all from a purely black American experience. Any excuse that you were probably just thinking of to give Drake for opting out of that part of his role in hip hop doesn't really hold up. Canada has plenty of black people and plenty of racism. Drake has had plenty of experiences with blackness being weaponized against him in his youth and as an adult. There's really no reason for Drake to pretty much never engage with black issues in his music but he doesn't. The rappers who have worn the crown and sat on the throne, the throne that Drake purports to sit on and has sat on over the last 10 years, those people have all unflinchingly carried on this pro-black tradition. Even more problematic and concerning figures like Lil Wayne aggressively engage in political discourses within his music at the height of his career. Today, some of the biggest rappers are black women performing this unique hood feminist form of gangster rap that takes similar shots at patriarchal and white power structures. Even Eminem has been intentional at times in his career about addressing social issues, even when he was at his highest, when it was a risk to his fame and his fan base, which has always been predominantly white. Hip hop, at its highest, but not always most commercial form, has always spoke to the struggle of black people. That's what makes it black art. And we've always had black artists who have opted out of that tradition in pursuit of greater commercial appeal like Drake has. And we've been fine with that, but it meant, or at least it used to mean that if you decided to take this route of least resistance, you couldn't imagine sitting on the throne of the culture. We will allow you to tap into your blackness and to capitalize off it like many of us do, like I'm doing right now. It's, it's, it is what it is within this, world of entertainment and media is the cards we've been dealt with. It's the best hand many black folks have to play. Either you slain the crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot. We've long since understood that the rest of the world loves black art, but doesn't like black people. So we have Minecraft streamers and TikTokers and whoever else casually adopting black sense and using black sounds and dances and music and slang and culture references to sound cool to their white audiences. And I feel like black culture as a whole has made peace with that reality. So plenty of black artists will rinse out their blackness, but keep their black consciousness on the shelf. And because we are loving and forgiving people to an extent, 
we will give you a pass. We won't call you out too much in front of mixed company, but don't come running back to us when trouble comes, Daniel Caesar. And don't expect us to celebrate you in the same way we celebrate those who actually do it for the culture. I think I've been in a lot of rooms. I've felt um, judgment and, you know, racial judgment sometimes, like being light skinned, you know, being Canadian, having people that I look up to and respect tell me that I can't identify with what's going on because, you know, and granted, I'm also not the most outspoken person when it comes to political issues. When you hear Drake complain and evoke this tragic mulatto nonsense about how black people aren't celebrating him and accepting him for his accomplishments, what Drake is trying to gaslight us into not thinking about is the fact that although Drake has always presented and sold blackness as his brand, he has never stood up for blackness in his music. I love how in this quote, Drake starts with honesty that he is not the guy really addressing these issues. But then he tries to finesse and, you know, gaslight us into saying, well, I do all my stuff behind the scenes. You know, the way we give back is is legit. It's on the ground. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not so you guys can all just like, you know, double tap and say, wow, oh my God, Drake's so like. You said if you hold your tongue, you'll get crucified. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know. So, so. I'm talking bigger shit than you and I. Kids are losing lives, got me scared of losing mine. And if I hold my tongue about it, I get crucified. I am sure that Drake has a byline in his accountant's budget or a number line in his income that says this much should be going to charitable and nonprofit entities. Makes perfect sense, as it should be. But that's the same thing fucking Walmart does. That's the same thing Target does. And Walmart and Target are not hip hop. In hip hop, we expect more from you. We've seen Drake put up the black box. We've seen Drake's posts about George Floyd and interview comments and things like that. We've seen it, it's nice, but that's the bare minimum. In his music, in the thing that is most indicative of his true values, he never puts his money where his mouth is, or more accurately, he always watches his mouth when it comes to his money. And you know who else does this? Flo Rida, the number seven all time selling rapper right above Tupac. Drake knows that if his music sounded more like Kendrick's or Cole's or Lupe's or even Kanye's to be real, despite all of Kanye's other issues, that he wouldn't have the same white fan base that plays his songs at frat parties and ignores his obvious shortcomings in hollow music. And this is not to say that Kendrick and Lupe Fiasco and all these other black figures I've mentioned don't have white fans, because of course they do. If you can see that in any concert footage that you see of these guys performing, but you can rest assured that Black of the Berry isn't gonna be a part of too many TikTok dances. The way that these fandoms move and how they exist is very different based on the challenges the artist is presenting to their fandom. And Drake presents no challenges to the white status quo that he is profiting off of. And maybe this is what bothers Drake. Maybe he thought he could do both. Maybe he thought he could opt out of the black artistry contract and still reap the benefits and love from the black community. For Drake to complain that black people aren't celebrating him the same way they would another artist and insinuate that it might be because he's biracial or Canadian or light skinned is gross. It's some gaslighting bullshit. Drake knows why he does not have the same level of love from the people is because he does not have the same level of love for the people. Maybe he didn't see himself or predict how he would change hip hop from this explicitly black art to being this worldwide shared phenomenon. Maybe Drake knows how hollow and fickle love from these pop fans are and that he's gonna need us going forward for the rest of his career or he's gonna end up having to do K-pop songs by the end of the year to maintain relevancy. And I personally can't wait for the Drake BTS crossover that will definitely happen between 2022 and 2024 or whatever other clout chasing thing he'll do to maintain relevancy. That said, it should be noted that a lot of this isn't really Drake's fault. Drake didn't do any of this to explicitly hurt hip hop 
or hurt black people. I don't think he's ignoring black consciousness because of his tragic mulatto nonsense that he tries to pull out here. And I wanna be clear, although I am calling out this tragic mulatto nonsense, as I've said earlier in the video, and as I said in other videos, I do think that there are significant reasons for biracial people to have issues with the way they're treated in black communities in some situations. Definitely get that. Drake just exploited and exposed flaws in the culture's dependency and addiction to clout and capital. Because at the end of the day, Drake is just winning at a game we kind of helped design. Capitalism commodified hip hop and we allowed it to slowly reframe the culture. Years ago, when the internet began equalizing the playing field and taking money and power away from these corporations and record labels, instead of collecting together to reclaim the power to steer hip hop, a lot of these gatekeepers focused on saving themselves and protecting their corporate benefactors. It is what it is. Instead of saying no to promoting certain artists and rejecting certain moves, we said a whole lot of yeses if the money was right. Despite the title of this video, I want to be clear. Hip hop isn't dead. It's just different and different is good. I don't spend as much time and energy following hip hop because I'm too old for that shit now. And that's appropriate. My time is over. It's not the kids, it is me. And it doesn't make sense to waste a ton of time being angry at Drake despite my jokes. But yeah, that's the reality here. But I do see the space Drake occupies as a pop artist in the world of hip hop. And it does bother me. I see a movie starring a black Puerto Rican kid from Brooklyn, and it starts with him listening to music and he's listening to Post Malone. And yeah, it feels like something's wrong there. It feels like something was lost. Drake's not really responsible for that. I feel like that is on my generation of hip hop fans, that we gatekept all the wrong things. Drake's fame and ubiquity and prominence in hip hop is really just meant to remind those of us from the golden era of how much we've allowed things to change and what we've lost in the process. That sting we feel when the youth show no regard for our legends, that's not their fault. That's our fault. And Drake is our reminder. We have a bad habit in my age range, and it's probably only going to get worse as I get older, of blaming the youth for the way they are maneuvering a reality that we designed without their input. And we need to own that. In the end, Drake isn't the person that destroyed hip hop. We are. And Drake is our punishment, our permanent reminder that we are the ones that let it be destroyed. without compromising the integrity of the heart. By 2016, if that same white guy talks to you on an airplane, wearing a fucking MAGA hat or something, and you're like, yeah, my favorite rapper is Drake, he's the greatest of all time. And you let out that same smirk and condescending look, the white guy would just smirk back at your ass. He'd be like, no, Drake is the greatest rapper of all time. And then ignore you and turn on a Steven Crowder video or some shit. Our soul is the one thing we own that for the most part we control and have agency over when it's time for us to capitalize on And when you sell soul, which understand if you're black in an entertainment, that's essentially what you're doing. It's understood that you should always be keeping some of it for the culture. And when you sell all of it, that's when you start calling them a seller. 